Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and today we're going to talk about a topic which is, I believe, the most common and popular question you'll ever get in an interview about Apache Spark, which is all about performance tuning. How do you optimize your applications? How do you make them run faster and faster? Now, I don't think it's really a problem most of the time in Databricks. I find it works really well with its built-in optimizations and features that are there, but it's always a question anyway, because I think it's one of those questions that's fun to ask somebody and see what they know. But it is an important topic overall. You need to know when things aren't going as well as they should, and you need faster or better performance, how to do that. So let's jump in. Where are we going? I'll start by talking about Databricks and the Apache Spark architecture, because I think that provides a really good point to kind of look at that diagram and say, where could this go wrong? What might the limitations be or problems be based on how the architecture of this is built? And then I'm gonna kind of step aside because I wanted to really abstract and say, what are some general sort of paths you take when it comes to performance optimization and tuning, meaning, if I'm on open source Spark, what's the difference between that and Databricks versus other things? So I'm gonna talk briefly about that as well. This is gonna be a real quick talk, so hang on, you'll be done before you know it. So let's take a look at the Spark cluster. Now, generally speaking, I'm gonna kind of assume this is on the cloud, but it pretty much is the same either way. But when we talk about hardware limitations, it can be an even bigger issue on the cloud, of course, because you have virtualized resources. Imagine here, we've got Mary Ellen here and she wants to do some queries and the data she's querying to keep it simple is a phone book. The example of the phone book is something, hopefully we still remember phone books, where you have your names and addresses and typically it's sorted by the person's last name. So Mary Ellen's gonna do some queries against that and it's stored on the cloud in external storage. And we'll assume maybe it's in you know Azure Blob Storage, or it could be in ADLS Gen 2, Azure Data Lake Storage Generation 2, or any other places. It could be a relational database too, but we'll assume it's in just external storage, that kind of thing. So she submits a query. Select city and count from phone book, group by city, order by city. Seems pretty simple, right? Now what's gonna happen on Spark is, when she's writing this query, and we'll assume she's using a Databricks notebook, but regardless of where she's executing it from, it's going to send her query through the driver node. And a node on a cluster is a virtual machine, which can have any number of core, memory, and disk space local to it. Now, a key thing about the driver node is it serves multiple purposes, but one of the most important is it's kind of like your C prompt in Windows, right? You go to the C prompt to do something or a Linux prompt. It's where you enter commands and it then gets sent out. So in this case, the query goes to the driver node and the driver node orchestrates what needs to happen. And the first thing it does is it takes the data that's there and let's assume it was originally organized by the person's last name and it's saying, whoa, that's not gonna work. I need to run this query to do a count by city, not by last name. And the only way I'm going to be able to do this query in parallel is if I reorganize the data and put a single partition on each executor, which is a core within each VM. And a partition is really just a way to chunk up the data, right? I want to get all of New York City together and send that to be counted. Then I'll take, you know, Albuquerque, then I'll take, you know, Schenectady or whatever city. And I'll take each chunk of data and send it to a different core where it's processed as a task, also called an executor, and it will do just that single count. Now that do count would happen separately for each executor. I just put it once to make it easier to fit on my slide, but it just has to say do a count, right? It doesn't have to say by city anymore, which is where the parallel execution really comes in. It just says, you've got all the rows for New York City, just do a count, boom. You've got all the rows on this partition for Schenectady, boom, do a count. So it's really efficient once it's organized the data. Now redistributing all the data over the cluster is not a trivial exercise, especially if it's a lot of data. The term coined for doing this is called a shuffle. And when you're looking at the Spark UI in the plan, you'll see this task called an exchange. An exchange is the internal code word for a shuffle. It's a very expensive operation, meaning it takes a long time to do typically, and obviously it's gonna consume a lot of resources. Now you need to do it. You know, Sometimes I feel like see people explaining shuffles, oh, don't do them. Well, you're not gonna get much work done without shuffles. But knowing that the costly operations means it's something to be very mindful of. Never do unnecessary shuffles because they're gonna cost you money. That's probably the biggest takeaway. Do them, but do them mindfully. So the count's gonna execute on each executor, so each partition is going to be calculated separately. And as each one completes, it will send the results back to the driver node. This has some implications too, right? Because if you're thinking, 
Well, does that mean the driver is going to have to have a fair amount of memory to be able to handle all these results coming back? Yes, it does. Depending on what you're going to bring back to the driver, you better make sure it has enough resources to handle it, in particular memory. So it's going to come back to the driver node, where it can then be presented to Mary Ellen, and she can see the results. Wow, great. And since it's sorted, she'll get to see it nicely sorted alphabetically. Now, looking at this architecture, I want to step back, and this is meant to be a really high-level 50,000-foot view. In this series, I want to drill down more in each area and talk more about what we can do to optimize performance. But let's just step back and think, where could this go wrong? So I'll call those constraints, things that can constrain us. The first thing to look at is, what are our resources? What hardware are we using? What we choose on that can make a massive difference. And sometimes people are trying to be so conservative on their resource consumption that they're actually undermining their success. What do I mean by that? What are you talking about, Brian? What do you mean hardware? Probably the most important thing of all is, what is the configuration of your nodes, both the driver and the worker nodes? If you go into Databricks, for instance, and you create your cluster, you have a huge range of options when it comes to nodes. Some are very minimal, low memory, not many core, not highly performant, and other ones are like stratospherically powerful, right? Some have GPUs so that you can do heavy machine learning computations and speed those operations up. So what you select there is going to make a difference. If you select nodes that have a lot of memory, a lot of core, then it's going to be able to do more work with less VMs and work faster and likely not run into as many problems where it might run out of memory and space and things like that. The speed of your resources also matters. Now you'll notice that the executors where they run on the core, they have local disk. And that's where if it runs out of memory, has problems when it's doing shuffles, for instance, it can spill data to disks, they call it. That's something you want to happen as quickly as possible if spills are needed at all. And if you allocate resources correctly, you may not get many spills, which is what you want. But if it does spill, or it needs to do any kind of operations to disk, you want to make sure that that's as fast as possible. The external storage also matters. I mentioned, for instance, on Azure, Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. You want the ADLS Gen 2. That's specifically optimized for Spark and Databricks kind of parallel processing, high-speed throughput. You want to minimize latency. So when you look at a lot of resources, there's a certain overhead in latency, and typically Azure, for instance, will publish those. For instance, Cosmos DB is supposed to be very low latency. ADLS Gen 2 is also something that generally should be low latency and, of course, always working within the same region. So hardware and resources are important things to consider. Software matters. Apache Spark is a lot of software, and that software has versioning and features. So the version of Spark you're using and what's implemented, as well as the Databricks runtime, that's what DBR means, is important. If you're running on a really old version of Spark or an older version of the Databricks runtime, you may be missing out on some optimization features that have been added and features you can leverage to tweak your performance as well. So keep an eye on what version of Spark and the DBR you're using. Environment configurations are important too. There's a lot of Spark configuration settings in particular that you can set that help to maximize parallel execution and maximize other features that make Spark perform better. You can look at the Spark UI and it will give you some pointers when you look at that. And I'll talk about that in a future video. But looking at that might give you a guide to say, hey, you know, this is spilling a lot. Maybe I need to change some of the Spark configurations so that it will spill to disk less. Or maybe it could be a hardware problem. You don't have enough memory, so it's spilling more to disk. So configurations matter. Now, I find most performance tuning and optimization videos or training really starts with your code and what you're doing wrong. Kind of blame you. But in truth, that is important. It makes a big difference. But if you don't get the other things right, then your application may not even get that far. You really have to make sure you've got everything in place to set you up for success environmentally before you worry too much about whether you've written code properly or optimally. So what do I look for in my code? The number one thing to do in your code is being mindful. That's my favorite buzzword these days, meaning be very self-conscious and aware of when you're doing things that could cause a shuffle or something that really adds a lot of overhead. A good example is the repartition function. Repartition automatically forces a shuffle and it may very well be that right after that, you're doing something like this, a group operation, and it shuffles again. So you can end up easily doing a completely unnecessary costly operation like a shuffle that never even got leveraged in any way. So repartition is a very risky thing. I was watching a video the other day and he said never use repartition. So that's how bad it's considered. So we'll talk about that also when we get down to that. But what you write in your application can make a difference. And there are things you can do to improve performance just by how you write your code. Data sources and formats matter. 
What I mean in this point is a data source could be on-premise SQL Server database, and you're going through their premise into the cloud, trying to get it into your Databricks environment. Of course, that could have a lot of latency and all kinds of problems. So that data source is particularly problematic. But you might also have extremely large, you know, multi-terabyte CSV files or JSON files, which are not compressed, and there's no good way to optimize it. In fact, Spark is going to have to essentially just read it all in, even if all you need is a part of the file. There are better ways to do that. Delta, Delta, Delta. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be a little spoiler alert, but Delta is a key to a lot of this. But data formats matter, and you have to consider that. Non-compressed, non-column store formats can really be bottlenecks and consume a lot of space also on disk and in memory if you're not mindful of these things. Data distribution is really key. It's the most important thing once you get past everything else, really, which is how is your data distributed over your cluster? Now, I like this example and intentionally selected it for a reason. We have said group by city and we are forcing, we'll assume here, it's going to partition the data to make this by city and distribute it over the cluster nodes in executives by city. What's the problem with that? Well, is that going to be like an even distribution of data or is it going to end up very skewed? Meaning certain cities are a lot bigger than other cities. In fact, New York State's a great example because New York City is probably like 80% or more of the entire population of the state. So one little executive could be really working like crazy trying to satisfy this query for New York City and Schenectady's node is just kind of hanging out, right? It's happy. It's finished in two seconds. So you don't want to kind of put all the work on one node. So you want to find ways to avoid skewing like that and make sure you're distributing the work in a more even way so that you're maximizing the parallel execution. And your ideal situation is where all your executives are finishing at the same time and returning the results, not waiting for that last one. Because what difference does it make if all your other nodes are done, but there's one little poor node there chugging away for six hours trying to give you the answer. It's unfair, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so take a look at that. Finally, let me talk about options varying by platform. I've been trying to get my head around, like, what's a good overall sort of rule of thumb of how to really make sure you're getting the best optimization? And honestly, my first thought was going to be that, it, you know, Databricks is the big difference. If you go to Databricks, it's going to give you all the answers. But even before you get to whether it's open source or Databricks, I think the root thing to be aware of is use Delta Lake. That's what I've done all this research on performance tuning. And that's the message I keep seeing. That's where all the new features are added. That's where all the best performance comes from. So right off the bat, use Delta Lake. Data Lake House is another word really for using Delta tables under the covers. But you want to be using the Delta tables Delta format. It gives many performance benefits and optimization. And I'll be talking about that too down the road. Once you get past that decision, the most important, then it's whether you're using open source Spark or Databricks. I was actually surprised that adaptive query execution, which is a really advanced feature, improving performance in Spark is available in open source Spark and Databricks. So kudos to Databricks for releasing that. I'm a little surprised because that I really thought would be proprietary. In fact, most performance enhancement features are available both in open source Spark and Databricks. Having said that, Databricks offers you a really good environment that's cloud-based, and just its ability to optimize everything it does in a cloud environment is already going to give you a lot of performance benefits. And they do have their own secret sauce under the covers enhancements that will also improve performance. But the most important one to be aware of currently is Photon. Photon is a ground up rewrite of the execution engine. You remember that diagram we saw where you get down to the executor, the core? Well, that's all running on JVMs, right? Java virtual machines, because the language which, which Spark is written in is Scala. The problem is that over time, the Databricks team had more and more trouble getting massive improvements in performance because of limitations and constraints related to the Java virtual machine. So Databricks decided, let's break this limitation and just start rewriting the execution engine itself in C++ and see if we can get it to run a lot faster. And the result is orders of magnitudes faster. It's a real game changer. It is proprietary at this point in time, so it is only available on Databricks, but it's a really massive improvement in speed and certainly a good reason to look at using Databricks over Apache Spark at this point. So wrapping up. We talked about Databricks and the Apache Spark architecture. And I showed you a diagram of an Apache Spark cluster with the various components and walked through how it works when you submit a typical query. And then I 
took a look at what are the potential areas where you can end up with a performance bottleneck. And we talked about, you know, hardware as a potential bottleneck, whether you're using Spark, what version of Spark or the Databricks runtime you're using. And that relates to things like the hardware, the software versions you're using, like Apache Spark versions and Databricks runtime versions. What are the data types you're pulling? What's the latency between them? There's a whole host of things we walk through that can slow down performance. And that, of course, also includes your application code itself. So we went through a lot of different areas. And the main goal there was to sort of provide a high level sort of set of categories of where things can go wrong and where you need to look to improve performance. And the main goal of that was to provide sort of a high level structure of what are the main categories of things that can go wrong to give you a guide of where you might look to improve performance. The application code actually was further down at the end because you need to get all the other pieces like the hardware, the software configuration, the versions you're using, things like that, kind of in place first before you worry about your application code. At least in my opinion, that, that would be a good way to go. And it's what I call low-hanging fruit, right? Make sure your hardware is adequate. Make sure the disks you're writing to are fast and use recent versions of Spark and Databricks because otherwise you could be just fighting something that was fixed long ago. Finally, I talked about tuning options and how it varies by platform categories, I'll call it. The number one takeaway there is use Delta Tables, which is also called Delta Lake, which is also called Data Lake House. Whatever you call it, you want to use Delta Tables as much as possible because they automatically perform better in almost every situation and give you a lot of control over how to tune it better. Beyond that, whether you're using open source Spark or Databricks will have some impact as well, especially since there's some automation and features you can leverage in Databricks that will make it a little bit easier to tweak things and make it run faster. In addition to the secret sauce Databricks offers, which inherently is going to optimize and run things faster in the cloud. The biggest difference I pointed out though between Apache Spark and Databricks currently, in my humble opinion, is Photon. Photon is a rewrite of the execution engine that runs on the Spark cluster, essentially obviating the JVM itself, the Java Virtual Machine. As I mentioned, Spark was originally written in Scala and it uses the Java Virtual Machine on all the executors to get things running. So Photon is written using C++ libraries, which are extremely fast. And although it still uses the JVM for a sort of a compatibility shell so that it can still work with the other libraries, it looks like they're gradually phasing that out. The important takeaway is the C++ libraries vastly speed up performance. It's only available on Databricks. It's not available in open source Spark. So that is one place where you can get a lot of bang for your buck if you use Databricks. Well, that's it for this time. Please like, share, subscribe. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.